Hello, everybody. Uh, we're going to start with uh, paper session 2A. This is paper session 2A. My name's Adam. I'll be moderating. Um, first talk we have is Mike Smale, the International Planetarium Society to update. The concern was the which means if they go up to three sessions. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. My name is Mike Smale. I'm with the Adler Planetarium, Chicago, Illinois, and I am the IPS representative to GLIPA, the Great Lakes Planetarium Association. So uh, I serve the function as sort of a conduit between IPS, which is an uh, international body, an international professional development body for planetariums with a number of chapters around the world. GLIPA is one of those 20-plus uh, chapters. And I am here to give a sort of an update on all things related to IPS. Uh, if you read the abstract, I will tell you, so I wrote the abstract originally as more of a general catch-all for IPS things that we would be talking about this year, but since seeing the other talks that have come in, there are some other talks that will go into much more detail on some of those things, and I will recommend those talks to you uh, at the, the relevant points. But uh, first off, I wanted to start with a recap of the 2016 IPS conference. IPS has their conference uh, every other year on the even years. I was at the Heavens of Copernicus Planetarium in Warsaw, Poland this summer. And uh, rather than give you the whole, like, you know, my summer vacation in Warsaw, I wanted to um, just uh, point out a couple of things they did at this conference that I particularly enjoyed that I thought were, were quite, uh, quite unique and quite different. Uh, at the opening reception, there was an activity that, uh, that took place where uh, all the delegates were handed this, uh, this little card. And uh, it may be hard to see from the back of the room, but it gives you some information about your star. And they had constructed an outdoor sky map space. So what would happen is you would get your card, and you would get a little, uh, a little flashlight, a little LED flashlight. And down here in the corner of this uh, card is a little piece of film that you placed over the tip of your flashlight. And that corresponded to the magnitude of your star. So you would take this outside, find the location of your star on the star map, and you got to be a star. Uh, it's a little tricky to, I think, probably to see on here, but there were two separate uh, skies. There was a northern sky and a southern sky uh, populated by all the various planetarians in attendance at the conference. And you can see everyone's holding their, holding their flashlight up over their heads, and you can see the sort of, uh, sort of glow, and the, uh, the photos were taken from kind of up above uh, the conference site. So that was kind of a fun little way to get, get, uh, get into the swing of things and get ready for that uh, fun week that we had. Uh, they also, oh, I mean, this is really dark, I'm going to apologize here. So uh, at the facility, they had a, a, lar a large dome. And then they also had two negative pressure domes outside because there were over 500 delegates in attendance at the conference. And with that many people, you have to get them through these spaces. So one of the evenings, they held a night at the domes where they had local food trucks come in. And they did unique programming in each of the three domes. And they were just sort of open access for the evening. So in their fixed dome inside, it's a little hard to see, but they have a piano. They had live music performances. So they had piano and trombone, and there were some strings. So with, with astronomical space imagery going on the dome. So you could pop into that for a little bit. And then they had a second dome where they had a DJ and very frenetic high energy music and visuals and dancing. And so you could go in there and dance for a little while. And then they had a third dome, third dome not pictured here, was chiller, ambient, soft, relaxing music, soothing space visuals. And you could just bounce between the spaces, interact, uh, catch up with, you know, everyone always wants more time to catch up with your colleagues, more time to socialize and network. And it was a, a great opportunity for all that. Uh, one more thing I wanted to point out was that we also got to see a, uh, a local school. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce the name of the school because I will butcher it horribly. But they built their own planetarium. And the students brought that planetarium that they constructed. They constructed it, reconstructed it at the, uh, at the museum, at the Science Center. And then they were there to talk about it. We were able to go in, see their planetarium, see their sky. They did uh, an interview for local, uh, local media there during the course of the conference as well. Uh, there's much, much more I could go into. Uh, we had a chance to hear from the uh, recently deceased uh, Klim Churyumov, co-discoverer of 67P. He gave one of the keynote speeches, uh, as well as Mark McCrayan from ESA, who also talked about Rosetta. It was uh, generally just a, a very well done uh, conference. A lot of GLIPA presence, which was awesome. About three dozen various papers and posters were presented by GLIPA members, which was awesome. Uh, you can read more the last, uh, there's kind of an addendum to the last issue of the planetarium that had some more about 2016. But uh, from the conference standpoint, looking ahead, IPS 2018 is the next one on the agenda. This will be in Toulouse, France. It is at the City of Space Complex, which if I could compare it to something here in the States, it's kind of a Kennedy Space Center. It's kind of a space science um, 
museum and complex. They have two domes, uh, both of which are about to be renovated. They have a large green theater. They have outdoor uh, rocketry. They have an observatory. Uh, quite a quite a wide uh, spread of of content. Uh, in addition to the city of the space region, which is a little bit outside of the old town, a little bit outside of the city center, uh, we'll be visiting a number of uh, various locations around the city for for banquets and receptions. And uh, these are just the pretty get you excited pictures about uh, what we have to look forward to. Uh, dinner one night in the uh, Jacobin Cloisters. Uh, Post-conference trip to the Pictou Midi Observatory uh, in the Pyrenees. Uh, but here's, here's what you really need to know. Uh, it's July 1st through 5th, 2018. Conference website is ips2018toulouse.org. They're on Twitter at ips2018toulouse. The page is a little spartan now, but they will be updating with more information as they have it. Bullet points, registration, $365, banquets, 90 the hotels, I will point out, the hotels they have pre-booked are all within a 10-minute walk of the City of Space location. Something we saw in Warsaw is a lot of people started using things like Airbnb to stay elsewhere, maybe just stay a little more in proximity. That is an option as well, but you, in this particular case, you may have to walk a little bit further to get to that location. Uh, it is Europe in summer, so airfare, you're going to be paying at least $1,000. Uh, fortunately, the euro is down against the dollar, so uh, once you're there, uh, hopefully the costs won't be... Uh, currently, the, the euro is down against the dollar. We'll, <laughs> uh, we'll see where that stays. But uh, Mark Mutan and their team are putting together a great conference. The theme is Planetarium Live in and outside the dome. So heavy focus on live presentation and education. Again, not just in the dome, but out in our communities. Uh, at the Adler, we call it here, there, and everywhere. We want to meet our guests at the museum, out where they are, and then elsewhere in our community. A very similar kind of theme coming up in Toulouse. Beyond 2018, 2020, uh, we received bids at the uh, IPS Council meeting from Bogota, Colombia, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and Houston, USA. They would all be in the summer, June, July, or August of 2020. Please go check out the poster sessions. I have a poster with pertinent information as well as binders of material from all these sites for the details on tours and costs and breakdowns. Uh, I'll also be happy to talk to you at any time if you have questions or curiosities about them. They're all good bids. Uh, registration for all of them is kind of in the four to $600 range. Some places are going to be a little more expensive to get to than others, uh, but they all have a lot of great things. And at the poster, there's an iPad where you can actually vote for your choice because next year at the IPS council meeting, I will be casting a vote on behalf of Glyph before one of these three locations. And that is a great way that you can let me know what site you think Glyph should visit. Speaking of the IPS Council, in 2017, the IPS Council is going to be meeting in St. Louis before the Pleiades National Planetarium Conference. And the IPS representatives from around the world are being encouraged to stay for the Pleiades Conference. So we should have a pretty good international turnout at that conference. A good chance, again, they want to come see what we do best. See a good a GLIPA, a good uh, US Planetarium Conference. So uh, next year will be a great opportunity for us to shine as well. There's some new IPS educational initiatives. I'm gonna to touch on them briefly tomorrow, I believe late morning, Sue Button is giving a talk over in the planetarium about both of these. These are uh, Voices from the Dome is a, uh, a project to get audio samplings of recordings about astronomical phenomena or astronomical planetary technology or functionality where people can record it and then any planetarium around the world can use those audio clips. Uh, the page on the IPS website, bit.ly slash IPS Voices, uh, case sensitive. That'll get you all the information. And then the Week in the United States is a spin-off of the Week in Italy for an American Planetarium Operator Project. This would bring international planetarians to a planetarium in the United States for a week to present shows, interact, teach lessons. Currently, the way that this is uh, structured, it's currently being funded privately. So there is, uh, there is money for to be, bring two planetarians to the US in 2017 and two in 2018. Casper, Wyoming will be hosting one of the sites in 2017, but they are still looking for another site to host in 2017 and two sites to host in 2018. So if you think you might be interested in getting involved with this, talk to Sue. Check out the, uh, the page on the IPS website. It has a lot more information about that as well. One more thing that came up quite a bit at the last, uh, last global conference was the Vision 2020 plan, this new organizational plan and guidelines for the IPS to allow the organization to continue going and growing, and there was much talk about that. Immediately after my talk, please stay where you are because uh, a number of members of the Vision 2020 committee will be talking at much more in depth about what they've been up to, uh, the excellent work. We met with them at the council meeting this summer. They have put uh, an incredible amount of time and effort into coming up with this new structure, this new plan, 
uh, and a lot of good things, uh, honestly, that we have to look forward to. So I think I'm just about out of time. Uh, any questions about IPS or how you can get involved or what they can do for you or Warsaw or, yeah. Yeah, I would just encourage any IPS members here to be sure to vote in the officer election that's going on right now. Yes, there's also immediately next to the IPS 2020 poster, there's a poster detailing all of the people running for IPS elections. Two of them are in this very room. Uh, President-elect, secretary and treasurer, uh, there are uh, all the candidates are from the United States, uh, this, uh, this go-round of elections, but elections are underway through the end of November, and you have to be an IPS member. You don't have to be an IPS member to vote for the location in 2020, but you do have to be an IPS member to vote for IPS officers. So. All right, and I'm around. Uh, we have a booth in the hall. We have posters. You can find me. So. Thanks. All right, thank you, Mike. Uh, next, uh, we're going to have uh, the Glippa Vision 2020 and IPS, uh, and these are broken into two parts, so um, I know we're a little ahead of what the paper schedule says because uh, Buck Batson's talk wasn't going on, but um, if you guys want to uh, take it away at your leisure, and I'll let you know. Well, thank you, Mike. Uh, that was a nice segue uh, into our presentation. Um, Mike did say that uh, he thought that the Vision 2020 was uh, doing good things. Uh, I, guess, I guess I can agree with that. Um, Vision 2020 came from, just a, a brief recap, came from a survey that was sent out to all IPS members uh, in late uh, 2014, 2015. And we had about four to 500 responses. Uh, the questions uh, to our membership or everything about what you like about IPS, what you don't like about IPS, what would you change in IPS, uh, what would you like to see done, uh, and everything else uh, in between if um, some of those questions did not uh, satisfy uh, what you wanted to see changed or not changed. So from that survey, which included vendors, which included all, obviously, the members, uh, which included non-members, anybody that really wanted to take the survey and become involved in that uh, was uh, encouraged to do so. So out of that, uh, Vision 2020 became an initiative and it became a team. And I'd like to um, give you an update what happened at Warsaw following the council meeting and the Vision 2020 uh, team. Uh, we uh, decided to have... Um, a presentation because half the team is here. Uh, so I thought that uh, I would quickly introduce the team. These are uh, the members. Uh, Carrie, obviously, is, is, is right here, and so is Mark, and so is Dan. But we also have uh, Ruth Colson uh, from NC, uh, uh, NSC Creative, and yep, Ver 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 Verilling from the Netherlands, and Mark Watson from uh, England as well. Uh, so we also have an advisory team that consists of uh, right now 10 members, international members from large organizations that are related to science and astronomy uh, throughout the world, including uh, you know, Hong Kong, uh, several sites in Europe, as well as the United States and Canada. So the advisory team is kind of like a sounding board. Uh, we make some decisions and we ask them what they think about it and they give us some input. So they've been uh, also very helpful. What I'd like to do is, because we really don't have a lot of time, is give you a recap of what happened in uh, Warsaw with the IPS console. Uh, and again, this is in two parts, and part one will just summarize uh, what happened in Warsaw. It didn't stay in Warsaw, but... So this is uh, our mission statement that console. Uh, IPS never had a mission statement, really. And so we finalized one, and it's to uh, provide the planetarium community uh, professional development, science literacy, and arts humanities awareness, innovative ideas, and partnerships in order to enhance the world's appreciation and understanding of our universe. Uh, that, I think, covers a lot of what we do. Uh, and so Consul was happy with this. Uh, they tweaked it uh, with one or two words, but uh, this is uh, until things change, that will be our mission statement. Our vision statement is the International Planetarium Society will be the creative and supportive resource for innovation, 
advancement, and cooperation among planetariums worldwide. We also decided that the IPS website really needs uh, updating. And so Consul uh, advised us to continue, advise us, meaning uh, uh, our team, to look at providing recommendations for next steps in redesigning the website. And we are doing that right now by looking at other uh, web designers uh, that are familiar with IPS. And so they will be asked to present a proposal, uh, and that will then be taken to, to council as well for next steps. So that's underway. Uh, but the big thing that we want to spend some time with, and the reason why we're all here, is really to talk about recommended membership categories or levels. This was a, if not the major, one of the major requests from IPS members and vendors on that survey that I mentioned. So what's in it for me? And, you know, right now, or the feeling, uh, feedback we got was that IPS only offers uh, a conference and a real slick uh, journal. Well, we want to fix that and, and be able to attract members uh, from all kinds of uh, institutions and involvement in the planetarium world, including uh, volunteers. So I'd like to kind of open this up to uh, the rest of us. Uh, I do have, uh, these are the levels that the council uh, kind of agreed on and the uh, amount of uh, annual um, so-called membership. Uh, the benefits are listed in the recent planetarium. So I, I did want to list all the benefits because uh, we'd be here for a while. But uh, I thought that this, these are the highlights, the individual, the large institution, the medium institution, small institution. Uh, I'll explain what that asterism is. And the corporate uh, benefactor, student career starter, uh, senior uh, retired, uh, the library subscription, business associate, and associate. So that asterism is that institution and corporate must join. In other words, they must join the IPS at, the, at that level. Uh, the employee members of these institutions receive their own logins and access to IPS resources. IPS would have a better list of the actual members who participate in some way in IPS. Currently, unless someone is employed or as an institution member, uh, I mean, that member is either the contact person or the, uh, purchases their own individual membership. And I think Mark from Adler can speak to that. They do not appear in the membership database as well. So the whole idea is to get, uh, if you have an institution uh, that has 100 members, uh, right now there might be just one or two members that actually come to IPS, but we have a potential there of, of picking up uh, many more members. So uh, I'd like to um, maybe open this up and, and uh, give you an idea of why this is so important. Any, Mark? Yes, let me just uh, reference. I think what you just said is kind of missing from this chart. Is that right? So yeah. if right, currently, if you are uh, an institutional member, you can send some people to conference. Often those people aren't members themselves. We don't know who they are. And often large institutions don't have that many members. So we have 500-ish, a little bit over 500 members, which I think at a conference year is a, a recent low. So membership has been going down. The potential, I think, with this new restructuring is to dramatically increase the number of members from 500. I think quickly we could double that, quadruple that to thousands of people. So, um, you know, if I have a sky scan, I I'm not, don't have to have a corporate membership. Everybody who works in the planetarium field, we think should be a member at some level. So we found easier ways for that to happen. We've got student memberships at $25. We have developing world uh, memberships for nothing. We have um, individual memberships for institutions that I, I believe are $40, is that, that's right, yeah. And that's not on that chart now, but $40 a year is pretty, pretty nominal. So our hope is that we can just really broaden the involvement in the community and get the energy that we need, get more revenue, um, and, and enable all the kinds of things we wanna do, we're gonna talk about doing next. So just for clarification, so if, if you know, my planetarium is a small institution, we have our institutional membership, and then the, you know, the, 
my individual employees would have their own memberships, or students at the university would then have their own memberships as well. That's right. So like right now, you may have one member, maybe you have a dozen, right? So that's, that's a kind of multiplicative effect we hope to enable. <coughs> Yes. So it's, it isn't free. Right. Right. Pay you right. And the students will pay twenty-five. Right. Which is lower than the sixty-five. Uh, <laughs> so that's a, that's a whole idea. Uh, anybody else? Uh, uh, I think the, um, you know. It, uh, once again, if you, if you want to go online, or um, I, I do have uh, a co uh, some uh, copies here of the benefits that are associated with all these uh, levels. So uh, they're also, again, in the recent uh, planetarian. Uh, but uh, we think this, uh, we spent an enormous amount of time and back and forth and energy on coming up with sustainable, attractive membership levels. We've compared them to uh, organizations similar to uh, the structure of IPS around the world and came up with uh, this structure. So. Um, I think, uh, it, like Mark said, uh, should increase, uh, hopefully, overnight uh, attendance or uh, membership and uh, revenue. Well, um, oh, John, should we mention uh, how this is going to be voted on? Yeah, we should. Uh, election, we're in an election cycle right now. And uh, we have two here in the room that are up for uh, election. And if you haven't already, uh, voting started October 1, but if you haven't voted already uh, as uh, a GLIPA member, you certainly want to vote for these, these two candidates, uh, Mark for, for president and Ann for, of course, uh, secretary. Uh, uh, treasurer, sorry. <laughs> secretary slash treasurer. Uh, so, uh, no, she, uh, she's running unopposed. But um, we, we hope that... Because Mark has works has been integrated in the Vision 2020, uh, and is uh, from Glippa, we're really hoping that uh, Mark will prevail. <laughs> that, that's very nice, John. I actually wasn't asking him to pitch for me, but <laughs> <laughs> I was asking you to talk about how we were going to vote on the. Uh, yes, I know. I was just. I'm, okay. I'm sorry, wait, okay. I had to put that in there because uh, we have an, we had an extra minute. I guess. So um, the, we we do need to, un, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, a uh, vote on this. Uh, this is um, this is going to be done because of the draconian bylaws that we have. <laughs> Has, has to be done on a paper ballot. And as I understand, all IPS members will receive a paper ballot. Now you'll vote, you'll vote, for, you'll vote for the uh, officers electronically. Uh, you should have already received uh, electronic notice on that. But this needs to be done because it's, it's in the bylaws to, uh, to be passed, uh, whether it's okay to even be voted on electronically uh, if, if everybody agrees. So there's going to be a paper ballot that's sent out and then you get to vote electronically on whether uh, we should go ahead and, and actually have these levels, these recommended levels. So I'm hoping that all of the IPS members uh, do, in, do indeed uh, and vote in favor of the membership category levels. And you know, just to underscore why we need Vision 2020 and modernization, the fact that we have to spend the thousands of dollars in hours of man time to mail out paper ballots and get the poor response rate we're probably going to get with the paper ballot is why hopefully this is the last time we have to do it this way. I just want to mention, um, uh, Glippa, of course, uh, we do still do paper ballots for some things. That's probably because we have great attendance at conference and we hold those votes at conferences. But you might recall about four years ago, if you were a Glippa member, then we actually voted on a large bylaw change in Glippa that allowed the executive committee and many other things to be done electronically. IPS's bylaws, when it was IPSE, were based on GLIPA's. Uh, in GLIPA, we've already modernized a lot of our bylaws to allow for electronic things to be done. IPS is catching up in this regard. So it's, it's a good thing. <laughs> so who's leading who? <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, uh, watch out for the ballot, and then uh, we'll see what happens, hopefully by the end of the year. Uh, so we, we should know. Uh, and this would be, uh, if, if voted in favor, this would uh, then be uh, active immediately. Um, the last um, slide I have here for part one is uh, the talk of, of having a paid staff. 
And I, I use executive director because that's been used the most, but it doesn't need necessarily have to be uh, that, that title given. But one of the goals of the membership restructuring uh, and goals of Vision 2020 is to increase revenue, which would help offset the cost of paid staff. Uh, so, you know, if we have um, more members and more revenue through membership, that's not going to be enough. Uh, and we know that. That's, uh, you know, to, to afford something just and, and pay for it by increasing membership uh, levels is not the way to go. So uh, we, we do know that this is going to be a lot of work uh, moving forward. And we really, truly believe that a dedicated paid person to handle uh, the load that needs to be done is the only way to go. So um, we are hoping that in the next several months that we'll have uh, a proposals or proposals put together for marketing and for uh, other revenue generating uh, resources that uh, will help uh, on an annual basis, uh, continue a, a steady revenue stream in order to uh, provide support for a paid person. So we really think that if you look at organizations around the world that are, again, similar to IPS, that have volunteers on, a, on the board uh, or staff in general, they normally have one or two or even more paid staff. And, uh, and we did some research on comparing IPS and, and organizations that were volunteer, all volunteer, and then they hired somebody uh, to make um, mission statements or vision statements actually work, and their memberships increased, uh, their revenues increased. And so we, we did do our homework and compared uh, organizations that uh, are similar to ours and where we want to go. So um, I hope that uh, this has been informative. And uh, so we're kind of up here for, I know we have a couple, maybe a minute or so, uh, for questions or any, any more feedback or? Uh, the timeline, uh, uh, well, um, our task is to um, get the proposals uh, to Consul, and, and then Consul kind of uh, directs the, uh, what happens next. So I'm... If I mean, it seems to me with everything... It just seems to me that with everything that is good that's happening here, that the web is a really critical part of attracting people and keeping people. Um, that that is a, a especially with the younger generation that does things with the web a, a lot. And I think uh, if we had a a really good web very soon, it might be great. Yeah. Well, my hope is that by the end of the year we'll have proposals. Um, and I also wanted to add to that too. IPS is increasing stepping up its social media presence in response to these goals as well. So even though the website, of course, it takes time to develop a new website, especially one that needs the robust features, IPS already is working on better web engagement than it has had previously and has added more team members to work on that. So hopefully, um, Consul will like what is presented and then act upon that. A and uh, that, that'll, I mean, that'll be up to the Finance Committee as well because um, the proposals will indicate um, you know, their costs. Somebody's uh, the what new well, a web designer is not going to do this on a voluntary basis. So I don't know how much that's going to cost. Also, worth noting related to that, uh, Glippa has in fact put about twelve thousand dollars plus into its website in just the last couple years. Uh, many of these things may in fact be invisible to you, but they make the conference run incredibly smoothly. A big part of our online registration comes from that. So it's important to remember, good websites are not cheap. And of course, uh, thank you to all the members and the sponsors for their revenue that has allowed us to do that. Uh, and basically, by building you know, these core modules of a website that is highly functional, it will continue to branch out and benefit everybody in many ways. So once again, IPS is at the start of that stage. And uh, you know, yeah, websites cost money. <laughs> Very true. Any other feedback? Uh, Keith, yeah. You, you kind of said some things. Can I, can I ask a couple of, uh, I'm just curious, 
what is the plan about content on that website? I know there were some specific things you said. Uh, there was clear that each individual, even at a major institution, would have their own login. Um, and I think you said some things about this, but what do you expect to end up adding content-wise on that website that's going to drive me to go there? Um. I can step in and say something about that from my goal. Uh, we'll get to me in, in a second, but I'm overseeing the Professional Development Initiative. And um, I had a nice conversation with Alan Gould last week, who is the webmaster for IPS. And he's excited to help me get some professional development resources on the IPS website as soon as we can get them together. So uh, I envision a, a big chunk being dedicated to professional development resources. Uh, and that could go on the current website and then get ported over to the new one. Yeah, I mean, I just, so I think Carrie's answer, is, the broader answer is there's a base level of cleaning up, making more beautiful and functional mm -hmm. with what we have. The next part of our talk is like, wh what should IPS be doing in the future? And really the answer is eventually the content we want to have. And the reason why we want people to be members is for all the content and offerings we're going to provide. And perhaps you should start with that, John. <laughs> all right, we'll just blend right into the second, uh, second talk. Uh, so, uh, the second, uh, we have uh, six goals in Vision 2020, and we have three of the team here. Uh, so, I thought that maybe um, the team could talk about their goals, especially with um, what Carrie just said about uh, professional development, how that relate to uh, the website, and benefits as well. So, uh, Carrie, you want Cool. All right. Uh, I think I can, I got a mic, but uh, the remote. All right, thanks. Um, as I just said, I'm overseeing the initiative dedicated to professional development. It's a passion of mine, so I was excited to be asked to do that. Um, the team's been really busy. You'll see the team members at the very end, but I want to tell you a little bit about what we've done already and a little bit about what we plan to do in the future. Um, oh, I thought there was one before this. One of the things that we did right away was to put together a survey because I'm a big believer in if you want to know what people want, you need to ask them. And so we put together a survey that uh, was put out in early 2015 asking people what they would like from a professional development standpoint. And I have a list here of the five most requested topics. They're kind of interesting to me. The first um, two I think of is planetarium survival, marketing and fundraising. Um, we've seen a lot of planetariums close due to lack of funding. People want help avoiding that. And then you can see the other ones there. Uh, Dan's probably excited about number three. Okay, so here was the second slide about what we have done so far. Um, we put together a survey right after IPS 2016. There was a general IPS 2016 survey and then one that we did specifically re relating to professional development. What worked? What didn't? What do you want to see in the future? Those results were shared, of course, with the team, with IPS officers and council, and also with the IPS 2018 host. Um, we haven't really shared it yet, but you'll see the bottom bullet point there is that we have identified challenges associated with different dome settings because the challenges that a school planetarium faces are quite different from that in a museum or nature center. And so I think it would be great if we could offer strategies targeting different types of domes. So what we learned, why were people there? Obviously networking was the number one. You, you go there because you want to be able to talk to like-minded people. Uh, they wanted to spend time learning about new technologies and software and learn about presentation techniques. And I was very happy to see that, especially in regard to live programming. Uh, beneficial activities, I'm not going to read all of these, uh, but you can get a, a sense of it there. I was happy to see that the uh, vendor presentations and the exhibit hall came in so high. A lot of interest in education research as well. And Mark, I want to point out, data preparation and interpretation came in third. <laughs> and finally, this is who's on the team. Um, I have a, a background exclusively with science center planetariums, and I knew that I was not going to be able to address the needs of all planetariums 
in all different settings all around the world. And so I wanted to make sure that I got feedback from people who work in different types of domes and in different countries. So uh, these are the team members. I know that at least Waylena McCulley is here. I'm not sure if Martin Ratcliffe is. I haven't seen him. But we are always happy to talk to you. If you have ideas about professional development, come and find us, email us anytime. Uh, especially me, I can easily communicate with everybody on the team. We want to hear what you want so that we can give you those things and make IPS as relevant as it can be. And that's all I got. Mark's next. Unless we want to take any quick comments on that? Huh? Mike's going, no. <laughs> um, so, so my goal has to do with outreach to the professional astronomy community, or science community in general. And I think um, we're, we're kind of at this transition point where there's tremendous opportunities and challenges. And, and those are enabled by not just the state of where technology in the planetarium is now, but also what's happening in science in terms of open data and open data standards and the sharing of things. It used to be that people just, you know, astronomers went to a telescope, they got their data, they put it on a magnetic tape and it hung up in their closet. But now it's being shared with the world instantly. And in the case of a project I'm working on, LSST, we actually want to share some of that data within a second of it being observed in Chile. All right? So that's, that's, that's the world that we're coming into. The challenge is, is that this community has no idea, no proper appreciation of what we can offer, the power of the planetarium, the power to present that to the public, to inspire people, but also, honestly, the power of it to visualize their own data. So part of the story is it's not just uh, a public good that you're doing by working with us. You can actually get something out of it. We have value. Um, so how do we build that? Um, and uh, you know, one thing that uh, I've chaired for a few years now is the Science and Data Visualization Task Force. And that group has been working and has a bunch of initiatives entirely related to this. It's um, how do we work in a way that's closer to the way scientists work? How do we bring these two worlds together? All right, so um, uh, at Warsaw, I just um, uh, reported on a couple of the things that were ongoing at that moment. Um, but the, the reality is, is that this is a bunch of individual conversations at hopefully at an organizational level where we can make organization to organization contacts but at the same time, the way that this partnership's really going to work is also at the individual level. And what we really want to empower is individual planetarians to, uh, to reach out to local researchers in their community. And we try to make that easier. So that's sort of the two-tiered strategy to make this uh, happen. IPS will handle the organizational contacts. And all of you need to reach out to all of the local people in your all right, so for some examples, um, we consulted with the American Astronomical Society um, and when they were actually taking over the stewardship of um, the Worldwide Telescope Software Program, which is running in many uh, planetaria. There was just an excellent presentation by Shannon in the back on this. <laughs> um, we're, we're having discussions uh, with, with uh, groups at the International Astronomical Union in, in particular, that if you know how that works, it works with these commissions, and the real work that happens in commissions is uh, in terms of working groups. And there's talk about forming a joint uh, working group. Um, and this may have actually, may shuffle a little bit, but this was our best thinking then, but between Commission C2, which is communicating astronomy to the public, and the IPS. The idea is that working group, uh, the chair of that working group would sit in on council meetings, have sort of an ex officio status of IPS, and contain members from both communities. Um, you know, ESO has been doing amazing things lately. They're building uh, this amazing supernova planetarium facility. And as you all know, they're also curating uh, an incredible uh, set of resources. Um, that They're really providing a lot of leadership and also a model um, of how planetariums and from different vendors and systems can share data. So uh, again, I encourage you to read the article, the Data to Dome article that's in the last issue of the planetarium that talks about some of that. 
Um, those dates are wrong. Um, it's now March uh, 2nd and 3rd. But um, likewise, uh, some of the stuff happening at NAOJ is incredible. Actually, my son just started college in Japan. I got uh, to tour their campus and talk about this workshop that we're setting up there. Incredible facility, 3D planetarium. Actually, one of the, honestly, one of the most amazing planetarium experiences I've had was just uh, getting a little tour of NAOJ's planetarium. And so uh, there's a lot of exciting, super exciting things happening in the Japanese community, but a lot of times it doesn't really leave Japan. Um, so we're going to have this workshop there uh, to sort of bring some of the stuff that IPS is doing down there and, and also learn from their community. We want to, uh, we're trying to raise enough money to bring in um, about a dozen people uh, um, from around the world as well, so, and probably a workshop of about 40 to 50 people. And uh, let's hurry up because uh, we're running out of time. We are very low on time. Um, so, can I ask a question before you move on? Yeah. Uh, tell me again what that workshop is. Uh, I, I didn't fully understand what, what, what was that like a small group from IPS leadership, like in your technology company, and, and this group are going to meet to further building goals, or is that something that yeah, like, you want the, members to come to? Yes, yeah. It's okay. a community and scientists working together on how you take different kinds of data and you visualize them. I guess who can go to this workshop as well? <laughs> I can <tell> <laughs> Okay, so I think very quickly, um, I took over goal number six from Jim Schweitzer, which is about providing support for leadership, blah, 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 blah. Hopefully you can read that. Um, uh, the gist of it, uh, one of the things I really hate about uh, some of the languages is, is uh, transition to next generation planetary design, technologies, and content. Um, often, a lot of people, when they say next generation, they mean Foldome, and Foldome is kind of the current generation. So, uh, you know, it's been around for well over, depending on what you count as the first Foldome, between like 15 and 30 years. Um, so what this is really focused about is, uh, since I took over from Jim, um, you know, we, there was a big SWOT analysis done on you know, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats for Foldome and next generation content, um, which I, th there's a lot to go into. Uh, but one of the things I think is really important is that we are already experts in immersive content. Uh, and IPS needs to leverage the membership and expertise it already has. And so that means moving people up into roles where they can further these goals further planetarium education, and also means supporting the initiatives within IPS that will already be key to this. So one of the great things I get to do with my goal is say, well, we need to do this and this with Mark's Data Visualization Task, task Force. We need to do this and this with professional development. We need to uh, do this and this with the, the Dome Design and Architecture Committee under uh, Ian McLennan. Um, and a big thing, I think, too, is just sort of general structural things, uh, much like something I've advocated for in Glippa. I think, by definition, a committee is not one person. It needs more people than just one. <laughs> Uh, and IPS definitely has a couple of one-person committees. And so by expanding these committees to be actually true committees, that also gives more people ways to become involved in the community, more ways to filter up this expertise, and in general, just showing respect to the fact that we are these big experts. And especially, like, the number one threat in this SWOT analysis is um, head-mounted VR stuff. And this is one of the things that, like, it actually should be, like, our biggest opportunity because again, we should be the leaders in immersive design. Um, many of us have been saying that for years. And leveraging IPS and these other larger organizations, we can bring to the forefront that we already are these experts in immersive design and spread that influence out into the wider world. Um, we're done. Luckily, that's the last slide. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to cut it short. We're at the end of the, uh, the uh, second paper session. Um, if you have more questions, please uh, get a hold of them and uh, interchange or interact with you and ask your questions. Um, I don't have my other sheet uh, for the schedule. What's the next thing coming up? Lunch. 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 Yes, we can't cut off lunch. <laughs> uh, so, big round of applause, everybody. Thank you for uh, the paper talks and the presentation. And if I can legally use extra time, uh, Jim had a committee for that goal, but since I took it over, um, I want to continue to grow and filter in new people. So if you're interested in participating with that, let me know. Detail at calacademy.org or just talk to me.